I want to understand how you, Shehzad Poonawala, right. a Modi critic, hmm. becomes a Modi supporter. Right. Actually, my original surname, a lot of people don't know, is not Poonawala. Then it is Jamada. We used to be a very uh, religiously oriented family. My father was the uh, community leader for the entire country for the Aga Khani sect. My mother is obviously a practicing, very practicing religious person. She used to, she continues to go to the mosque every day. And when I was young too, I used to go to the mosque every single day. My mother feels that I should be more uh, uh, generous in terms of letting go of things on air and, and I should allow the elder brother to get away with some. But I tell my mom that, you know, even in the Mahabharata, I mean, it was essentially fought against cousins. Yeah. yeah if if uh, Arjun was uh, was not to listen to Shri Krishna, then you would have had the quarrels win. So, for the Pandavas to win, sometimes they have to listen to Shri Krishna and not their mom. I have taken a conscious decision that I will probably never have my own child. If at all, I will have an adopted child. Selected by whom? By Sonia Gandhi. Who do you think they're going to pick as delegates? Obviously, those people are going to say Jai Rahul Gandhi. So where was the election for the delegates? There were no elections for the delegates. When you were in the Congress and you still believed in the Congress model, did you ever have a proper conversation with either of the Gandhi siblings? Yes. I told them that we can't go on with this kind of system. That, And I also went to the extent of saying that neither of them should play a pivotal role in the Congress party going further. You said this to their face? Yes, of course. Ever since I said that, there was only a manner of distancing me from every platform where people are not lynched and killed. Where is Rahul Gandhi's tweet? Where is the tweet of any of these worthies who want to save democracy? And ironically, in Bengaluru, they will be meeting the same Mamta Banerjee against whom Adhiranjan Chaudhary is railing. He's saying Mamta is killing democracy in West Bengal. You um, used to call yourself mm -hmm. an Heruvian. Right. What changed? Or would you still say, mm -hmm. because I don't think Nehru's legacy is owned by any political party, That's right. right? No, I would you still call yourself a Nehruvian? Well, uh, I would call myself Nehruvian. I would call myself uh, Gandhian. I would call myself uh, Chandrasekharian. I would call myself Devagaudian. I would call myself Modian. Shehzad Poonawala, let's start at the very beginning. Yes. Why politics? Because I think that uh, in order to make change, societal change and change that will have an impact, uh, you need to be in politics. That's where you can drive policy. That's where you can actually influence people. And that's where you can actually use the... Uh, medium of politics to to transform people's lives as is being done by the prime minister right now when he reaches out to millions of families who are poor and gives them social welfare and gives them an aspirational level of living that wouldn't have been possible had narendra modi been running an ngo mm. so therefore you need to be in politics because only through politics through the instrument of politics can you make real social change i don't believe anybody who says that i will stay outside politics or they mock politics or they have a cynical view about politics they are entitled to do so but you can't really make that lasting impact and change unless you are in politics do you sometimes feel cynical about politics because after all it is political differences that in a way destroyed your relationship with your brother Tehseen Poonawala. Before that, at the very beginning, both of you as brothers arrived to the national capital together. You both started your political journey with the Congress. It is only when you diverged and went your own way and you know uh, forged a different path that that relationship broke. But you know, just like, uh, sometimes people say, Ki bhai business or family ko mix mat kare. Mm -hmm. Do you sometimes think that politics broke your relationship with your brother? I think uh, you can't blame politics for that. Uh, for that, you have to blame both of us, if at all. We both have uh, handled or mishandled our relationship in such a way that the relationship couldn't go beyond our political differences. There are many people who have uh, severe political differences and stay in one house. I believe uh, Ashitosh has listening to his interview and I think his brother has a completely different view yeah, than his. His brother is a Modi fan and he's uh, a Modi exactly. critic. But they managed to uh, salvage or keep their relationship. I think uh, 
Taisin and I uh, both are adults. We both know what paths we want to pursue. Uh, I am very clear though that my political uh, instincts and leanings and principles uh, can't be put under any other relationship. For me, my commitment to my country and its political principles is far more important than my commitment to the parivar. So I put. Uh, people and desh above parivar he is loyal to the parivar i am loyal to what i believe is is good for the country do you talk to your brother at all we don't talk on a regular basis at all actually we've not spoken for many years now but of course when he uh, recently delivered a baby boy he and his, uh, his lovely wife monica so obviously i congratulated them and uh, i got an opportunity to see uh, my nephew so that that bit yes and how did did he reciprocate You mean the nephew? I don't, know, <laughs> I don't think uh, no, Tessin wasn't around when I went to see his uh, little boy. But uh, I'm sure that uh, look, uh, I think Tessin is a good person. Uh, he's a good human being, perfectly fine. He's very nice. People tell me that he's a very nice person, etc. And I too agree with that. But the fact of the matter is that uh, what do we fundamentally disagree about? What we fundamentally disagree about, and we disagreed about it even when I was in the Congress, is that I don't feel that the Gandhi family. or uh, or the larger congress's way of running things where it is very family oriented is the way to do things i said this even while i was in the congress in fact i paid a heavy price because while i was in the congress i used to make these points known and therefore many positions or many opportunities that were due to me were never given to me because i had that view so i have paid a price while being inside it and while raising my voice and i continue to stand by that principle when i'm outside shazad we now know you as one of the most eloquent impactful and deeply researched spokespeople of the bjp and we'll come to how and who does your research a little while later in our conversation i want to take you back to those years when you were in the congress party uh, and you know you had a chance to work closely with at least three congress leaders that i know of digvijay mm-hmm. singh rajiv shukla and manish tiwari yes. right did you at that time mm-hmm. believe in the congress philosophy you and your brother were even in the war room for the congress party right. in the up election in the right. up assembly election at one point right. we'll get to why you left later mm-hmm. but when you first joined the congress when you first worked so closely with these three leaders uh, what did you feel at that time about the congress party and what tipped it for you uh, look uh, you know why did i join the congress party first to even work uh, as part of it in the student wing or the youth wing Uh, many years ago when i was just a teenager in school at that time when you read history textbooks and when you read a lot of things you feel that the congress party was the sole champion of the freedom movement it has a deep impact on anybody growing up and with that limited knowledge one always feels that if a party or if a, an organization has done so much to attain us freedom you are influenced by that and therefore you want to join and contribute in the nation building process uh, you are obviously reading about mahatma gandhi or reading about other leaders of the congress party and therefore you join that uh, organization to contribute in that same spirit but even when i joined the congress party and when i worked with these leaders i would make it very known that it has to be talent that is recognized because whatever i had read or or uh, learned about the congress party it was always a talent driven party you remember when mahatma gandhi and lokmanya tilak and all these stalwarts were in the congress they used to have elections they used to have elections between mahatma gandhi lokmanya tilak uh, abdul uh, kalam azad subhash chandra bose ji but that entire process post the 70s took a downturn now when rahul gandhi entered politics he told a lot of us that he would bring it back to what it was originally that he would allow merit to prevail that it would not be surname or it would not be papa's name but it would be capacity and talent that would dominate but then you know after giving him 10 12 years to work at it because the congress is like a titanic takes time to steer the ship nobody is expecting and literally it's meeting the fate of the titanic mm. or uh, perhaps even the submersive submersive uh, but uh, having said that one gave him ample amount of time to actually make those things possible but what i felt and what i discovered was that even after 10 years only what mattered was your surname the entire youth congress for instance let me just give one example uh, we used to feel that okay chalo now the youth congress doors are open for us we'll contest an election but the election system was so rigged that only a person who had huge amount of financial resources and that could only happen if you were a second or third generational politician 
that kind of person could contest. So most of our youth Congress presidents were somebody's son or daughter. And therefore, he did not make it less feudal. He, in fact, made the system more feudal, where he would only surround himself with people whose fathers had worked with his father. So remove your BJP hat for a moment and answer Justice Shehzad. What did you think of Rahul Gandhi then? And what did you think of Rahul Gandhi? Not now, because now we know what you think. In 2017, as you get ready to leave the Congress party. Well, I always thought of Rahul Gandhi as somebody who was saying things, but I was waiting for the delivery of those things to happen. The things sounded very good. He would say that we want a system that allows young people to come in. He would say we want to give an opportunity to people at the grassroots. All of these things sounded very attractive, but was it being delivered within the Congress was always a question mark. And secondly, what I felt of Rahul Gandhi right from 2011 onwards was that he was not accessible. This was something that I felt within the Congress and most people, most of my colleagues felt that he was not accessible to us. And perhaps one of the reasons was that my surname was not perhaps say, you know, a pilot or maybe some other family friend of his father's. Had I been a family friend of his father's, I would have got much more access. And therefore, what I came to believe and see with my own eyes uh, towards the end of 2014-15 was the fact that Rahul Gandhi was not willing to change and he continues to not be open to change. He, he may project himself in a certain way, but he is actually not open to that change. And therefore, many people after me have left the Congress party as well. You wanted to actually contest elections for the post of party president. I didn't want to actually contest those elections. What I wanted to establish was that it was not an election. You can call a Taj Poshi an election. It doesn't become an election. You know, uh, North Korea may call itself People's Democratic Republic of North Korea. It doesn't mean that North Korea is a democratic republic. And therefore, what I wanted to establish was that the Congress party was conducting perhaps the most biggest farce in the name of an election in 2017. And it got proven when... The entire manner in which the delegates, delegates have to be elected. They can't be selected. Mm. The state presidents, if they are selecting delegates who are going to vote for the national election, and those state presidents have been sel selected by whom? By Sonia Gandhi. Who do you think they're going to pick as delegates? Obviously, those people are going to say Jai Rahul Gandhi. So where was the election for the delegates? There were no elections for the delegates. When you were in the Congress and you still believed in the Congress model, did you ever have a proper conversation with either of the Gandhi siblings? Yes. I told them that we can't go on with this kind of system. That, And I also went to the extent of saying that neither of them should play a pivotal role in the Congress party going further. You said this to their face? Yes, of course. What, what was the context for you to say this? The context is that if the Congress party truly believes in these large principles that Rahul Gandhi espouses, the charity should begin at home. The charity and should And how did they respond? Home. Well, the response was that ever since I said that, there was only a manner of distancing me from every platform. It was taken, of course, on the face of it, nobody, no politician is going to say, oh, how dare you tell me this. But what they do is that they engineer and uh, orchestrate the entire mechanism to sideline you. And therefore, I'll just give one instance. And I think back then you were uh, working in the TV channel and Sandeep Kukan was your colleague. He filed a story about how there was a training for spokespersons at that point of time. And uh, I was perhaps one of the best spokespersons, but they got my name drop, dropped off. And uh, Mr. Surjewala, uh, lo and behold, his father was a family friend of the Gandhis. Were, and Ajay Makan, who also had family relations with the Gandhis, were the ones who were heading the department. You um, used to call yourself mm -hmm. an Heruvian. Right. What changed? Or would you still say? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think Nehru's legacy is owned by any political party. That's right. Right? No. I would you still call yourself a Nehruvian? Well, uh, I would call myself... Nehruvian, I would call myself uh, Gandhian, I would call myself uh, Chandrasekharian, I would call myself Devagaudian, I would call myself Modian. Every Prime Minister is our Prime Minister. Why would we disown our Prime Minister? Should we disown our Prime Minister? In fact, I think the biggest tribute that has been paid is the fact that instead of making, uh, you know, museums or, um, uh, or places for one prime minister, now we have a museum for all the prime ministers. I ask you this because there's a sense that the BJP or sections of the BJP 
some of its support base target Nehru. And for someone who used to identify but as Nehru's a Nehru, holy cow. No one is a holy cow. But no one have, is a holy cow. No, in my opinion, yeah. no one is a holy yeah, cow. So, in public life, no one should be a holy cow. No, so there's no problem if uh, if sections or I think everyone should candidly analyze the entire tenure of Nehru and they should come to their conclusion whether he may have been very good in certain aspects but he did actually make mistakes and blunders I would say when it comes to handling of Jammu Kashmir. He made blunders about how the manner in which he handled China and it is a fact and in fact I was seeing his first interview the first interview he gave to BBC. I saw that. You've yes. seen that right? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's on social media yeah. these days. Please see the kind of uh, I would say naivety he has towards China. He almost is saying that, you know, uh, well, uh, the Chinese are pretty good to deal with. And I think that naivety cost us. So why shouldn't people from my political party or from any party or from no party at all be able to stand up and question what Nehru did wrong? Is it necessary that uh, the Congress party wants us to do Nehru Chalisa all day long? That's not how it works. In politics, you analyze a person and his contributions, the good things you celebrate, the, the, the things that are mistakes, you must put it out in the public domain. As Anil Antony uh, left the Congress and joined the BJP, you went on Twitter and you said, go ahead, have your yes, coffee. Yes. You went on Twitter and you said, said, oh, this is just like what happened to me. Hmm. What was the parallel that you saw in what happened with Anil Antony and yourself? You know, uh, the Congress party champions itself as this uh, poster boy of tolerance, acceptance. We accept differing views. We tolerate differing views. But it's not so. Anybody who has a view contrary to the view of the first family is immediately sidelined shown the door and is treated with a manner of disdain. And this is a problem. Let me give you example after example. Forget uh, Anil Antony. He expressed a view about the entire BBC affair. Isn't it double standards that Indira Gandhi's government had actually banned the BBC? For two years. For two years. The UPA government actually did a survey on the BBC on the same uh, economic or taxation issues that are grappling the BBC right now. When you do it, it is chamatkar. When somebody else follows the law and does it, it becomes, oh no, you're, uh, you're actually trying to stifle their voice, etc. And those who have become the champions of free speech for BBC and their documentary, despite the fact that it did not include the Supreme Court version, not once did they say that let the Kerala files also be shown. Hmm. On Kerala story or on Kashmir files, they have a completely different take. So having said that, Anil Antony expressed a view. You could have said, all right, that is his view. But you go and start trolling him, people and leaders start sidelining him. Before that also, look at the manner in which Gulam Nabi Azad was treated. Look at the manner in which other tall leaders of the Congress were treated and Himanta Biswa Sarma. Himanta Biswa Sarma is a man of exceptional caliber. But if you are going to treat somebody and make him eat from the plate that you offer to your dog, I think that is not the, we are not here as servants of the first family. We were there to serve an ideology. We were there to serve a party. We were there to serve a cause. We were not there to serve the family. So if the family feels that I am the party and anybody who takes a line against the family is against the party, which you have seen. But how much space for difference of opinion is there within the BJP? Oh, lots. Give me, an, give me an example. Uh, I can give you so many examples. Mr. Shatrugan Sinha, for instance, he kept criticizing the BJP for so long. Who took action against him? Subramaniam Swami, who took action against him? Uh, Mr. Kirti, they all left the party and they went. They went for greener pastures wherever they felt they had an opportunity. Some, some might say that about Anil Antony. Some might say that about Chetan. What, what has Anil Antony got? What has Anil Antony been, Antony been given by the BJP? Nothing. Nothing. He's there. He's working for the party. Let's what has he got? No, but let, let me just complete that thought and then maybe we can yeah. move on. Uh, so, please tell me, look at the difference in which the BJP treats people who dissent from its point of view. For instance, a Shatrugan Sinha or for instance, a Kirti Azad or a Subramaniam Swami versus how the Congress treats anybody who even says a one line different from what the script of the first family is. Immediately, they are discarded as Gaddars the next day. How come they were wafadar till they were with you? But and there's Gaddar also the next open day? rebellion by a Sachin Pilot and Avjot Siddhu. I mean, I can give other examples also from the... Ha, on Sachin Pilot. You know when Sachin Pilot revolted, what did he say? His three official reasons were that paper leaks, mm. uh, some issues relating to corruption and the governance issues of Ashok Gallo. 
Mr. Uh, uh, the the in charge of the Congress Party in Punjab, uh, I forget his uh, name. The gentleman from Punjab, who is the in charge of uh, Congress Party in Rajasthan. Yeah. Uh, he promptly issued a notice saying that Sachin Pilot is engaging in anti-party activities. This is the official stand of the Congress. So, if you are so democratic, then why are you issuing a notice saying that Mr. Sachin Pilot is doing anti-party activities? You should have embraced it. Yes. In fact, uh, Gehlot. Mr. Gehloth, on record, put the phones of the Congress MLAs on tap. He admitted this in the Vidhan Sabha of Raj Sabha. Their uh, Dalit MLA, Mr. Ved, uh, Ved Solanki, is on record to say that Mr. Gehloth filed sedition cases and tapped their phones. And those sedition cases, I don't know if they've been withdrawn till now, but in the assembly, they have acknowledged that these cases were put against their own MLAs. Uh, so much democracy. Let's talk about ideology. Right. right? Um, you're Muslim. Yes. Let's first talk about how you grew up, mm. what religion meant to you, how much of a part of your life it was. Mm. I think a lot of people don't know about your Pune years, yes. right? Let's talk a little bit about that. Then we'll come to the politics. Well, you know, uh, I come from a family which is uh, basically Shia Aghanis. Yeah. And uh, the Shia Aghani, uh, Sh Shias and Sunnis are different sects. In of Islam. course. And uh, the Aghanis are a subsect of the Shias. It's like uh, there are the Boras who are yeah. Shias. Yeah. There are the Aghanis, the Nizamis, other sects, uh, subsects in the Shias. So I came from that family. And uh, we actually, my original surname, I mean, a lot of people don't know, it's not Punawal. Then? It is Jamada. Really? Yes. My real, uh, so I'll tell you, my father uh, and his brothers. Uh, who were there with him, uh, they had they carried the surname Jamada. But when my father got into business and he started on his own at the age of uh, 20, 22, whatever. And he at that time, because Jamada basically means toilet cleaner. Yes. Uh, so it has a certain kind of connotation with it. So in the business field, he felt it would be better to have a surname. So he took the surname of Punawala himself. It was just an acquired surname? Yeah, yeah it was just an acquired surname. It's, there's no story there's behind no, Punawala. No, I mean, a lot of uh, Parsis and Muslims in uh, Pune keep their names after uh, locations or after professions. So you'll have like Bambu. Adar and Cyrus. Yeah, so Adar, Punawala, or yeah. there are a lot of Boras also who are Punawalas, and then there are uh, Aghanis like us who are also named after our profession or after a location. So you may find a Banduk Wala, you may find a Puna Wala, you may find a Supari Wala. So all these Walas are there, right? Uh, so my father took this surname, but originally my name is Jamada, which by the way is one of the, uh, is the backward uh, classes, uh, which would also come under the Pasmandas. So now uh, we used to be a very uh, religiously oriented family. My father was the uh, community leader for the entire country for the Al Khani sect. Uh, subsect. So he was quite a prominent, uh, he was not a religious leader because my community is is very uh, business oriented. Mm. So it, it balances both the materialistic and the spiritual. And my father used to head a lot of the affairs for the community uh, and look after all of that. So we were very inclined. We were, my mother is obviously a practicing, very practicing religious person. She used to, she continues to go to the mosque every day. And when I was young too, I used to go to the mosque every single Day. Every, not, day. every day every day not five times a day no, but every day uh, yeah, we don't uh, we don't, you, have you don't five do the namaz five times no we don't do it five times a day but uh, the mosque uh, that we have to go and pray in uh, we used to go in the evening so at that time every day we would go to the mosque we would have uh, religious classes as well so that was in the mosque and basically we grew up uh, uh, both my brother and me used to go to the mosque almost every day uh, Fridays were special days obviously but uh, we used to go every day so being a Muslim or or my faith is is an important part of who has, what what has shaped me but that is not my only identity because while that may be a matter of choice actually it's a matter of chance I was born in a Muslim family I was born to Muslim parents but the culture that we have on my entire community, if you see their cultural practices and their tendencies, there is nothing different from the average Indian practices or average Indian tendencies. And therefore, I identify myself as Muslim by faith, but Indian by culture. So that is what we must realize that our cultural lineages and our cultural uh, combinations are much more stronger. And therefore, I identify more with my Hindu friend 
here in India, but I don't identify with somebody in the United Arab Emirates uh, yeah, or obviously, Saudi. Obviously. And therefore, what we need to say is that we are Indian Muslims and Indian Muslims are a different category of Muslims compared to all the Muslims across the world because Indian Muslims actually have given a wonderful example of how they can be assimilated and how they can assimilate into a society and become one. What does religion mean to you today? You, you As a child, you said that you went to the mosque every day. Uh, but then, you know, we all grow up. We have our own relationships with our faith or we don't. What does religion mean to you today? Religion should be and I believe is, is an extremely personal uh, matter. And religion should not interfere with the manner in which you behave in say in a civilized constitutional manner mm. you cannot have the 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 leeway to say that because my religion says this i will not follow the constitution or i will not follow the law that part of uh, argument can't be made religion is something that you practice you practice at your home you are very well entitled to to carry your religious identity but that religious identity can't superimpose or or be above your national I agree. identity and your national. I agree. I just want to understand what it means to you today. Well, it means to as me, a young man living in Delhi, not with his mother anymore. Right. Uh, you know, uh, what does it mean to you? Well, uh, religion to me means a way in which I know that I have to answer my Maker for all the things that I do eventually, and therefore I must be guided upon the right path, and that. Religion for me, now, you know, some people need to go to the mosque and pray every day. Yeah. Some people go to the mandir and pray every day. And some people don't necessarily go to the mosque and pray every day, but doesn't mean that they don't have a connection with their maker. I think everyone's connection with their maker is an individual connection. And of course, we all believe in God, but how we communicate with God, I don't think that some third party needs to come and instruct me on that. And therefore, religion for me, is a very personal, private affair, which I keep to myself. Your your mother, how is she? Your fa father died when you very were how old? I was five. You were five. How has your mother made peace with the fact that her two boys, not just took different political yes. paths, that would be all right, it happens in many families, but that her two boys don't talk. Do you talk to your mother? Yes, of course. I talk to my mother on... Uh, every day and uh, we share a lot of whatsapp messages and uh, uh, so she does she ever comment on your television debates oh she does she always does and what does she generally say she's usually telling me to uh, be more nicer to my elder brother uh, but uh, <laughs> you see I tell her I tell her that for me it is not about A or B or C who's against me in the panel yeah. it is about me representing my point of view with the entire amount of uh, passion or the entire amount of commitment that I have. I can't just because somebody happens to be related to me and is on the opposite side doesn't mean that I will uh, allow him or give him a leeway to make a point which I feel is patently false. I will counter him. So my mother feels that I should be more uh, uh, generous in terms of letting go of things on air and, and I should allow the elder brother to get away with some. But I tell my mom that, you know, even in the Mahabharata, I mean, it was essentially fought against cousins. Yeah. yeah if if uh, Arjun was... Uh, was not to listen to Shri Krishna, then you would have had the Kauravs win. So for the Pandavas to win, sometimes they have to listen to Shri Krishna and not their mom. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's talk about um, how you used to feel. But my mom is uh, graduating now and she's seeing some uh, amount of... Uh, I mean, she's a committed supporter of the Congress party, obviously because Tehseen uh, stays with her and, uh, you know, but she's she does realize that some things were not right and that uh, and that Prime Minister Modi, at least uh, when he's doing certain things, when it comes to infrastructure, delivering of social welfare, she, she I was does just going to, I was just going to ask you that, that you're such a persuasive spokesperson, but have you been able to convince your mother to change her position? Actually, preference? I don't want to convince her because, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I don't think that... Uh, I need to start uh, converting people uh, in, everywhere. I think people for themselves experience and they understand that who's doing what for the country. 
in the last nine years, if you see the kind of things that have happened in this country, whether it's uh, on the economic front, we've grown as an economy. Our infrastructure has visibly improved. We are building more highways. We are building more um, networks, uh, digital networks. Money is being transferred through digital transactions. And uh, the entire digital ecosystem that has created, where now when you send one rupee, that one rupee is reaching the beneficiary. It's not 85 paise. It's not being grabbed by any... Uh, Panja. So, you know, when that is happening, I think people for themselves experience and they are automatically converting themselves. For instance, let me tell you, my mother was most against this use of mobile phones and digital technology, mm. completely against it. Mm. She is she is a traditionalist. Yeah. But today she makes uh, UPI payments, she makes digital payments. Mm. And that transformation has happened now and she realizes how convenient and easy it is for so many people. And without me even saying a word to her, she at least endorses that part. I want to take you back to an article you wrote in 2007. No, it maybe not in 2017, but somewhere thereabouts right. for the Daily O, which used to be an India Today website, opinion website at that time. And you wrote about violence that is associated with cow vigilantism. Right. And at that time, you were still with the Congress. You were criticizing a lot of things about the Congress leadership, right. but you still identified as a member of the Maharashtra right. Congress. And in that article, you spoke about how disturbed you were at many of these lynching murders that had taken place. Uh, you mentioned Junaid, you mentioned Pehlu Khan in Rajasthan, and you spoke about a clock. Right. And you said how you were very disturbed that the Indian tricolor was draped on a clock's murderer in the presence of then Union Minister Mahesh Sharma. I'm quoting from your own no article. In fact, you mentioned that you and your brother at that time were in the Supreme Court to ask for a new law to stop mm. this violence. Today, how do you look back? Those incidents happened. Right. You felt what you did, right? Yeah. How do you reconcile mm. to your, you know, to that sentiment with your present position as a BJP spokesperson? Because some of these incidents right, uh, uh, happened tracing themselves back. It, it, at least, as you said, Mahesh Sharma was there when the flag was draped on a Clark's murderer. He was a senior BJP leader. Mm. How do you make peace with that today? Barka, have you heard of Khetaram Bhi? I have. You will tell me. Yes. I'm going to wait for you to tell me. And uh, have you heard of Sushil Giri Maharaj? No, I haven't. This is the problem. The problem is that, of course, the lynching of an Akhlaq or Junaid or Tabrez is absolutely condemnable. There can be no justification for it. And in a civilized country governed by the rule of law, no lynching should be allowed in the name of any, any cause. And even the Prime Minister no less has spoken about this in very categorical terms when he called out those who by the daytime are something and by the nighttime they transform into something else. No less that the Prime Minister spoke about it. But those who speak about Dalit lives matter. In Rajasthan, the highest number of lynchings and killings of young Dalits by Muslim mobs have taken place. Khetar Ambil was killed because he happened to fall in love with a Muslim girl. A Muslim mob killed him. Where was the outrage of Rahul Gandhi and company? And I say Rahul Gandhi because he champions these causes usually at a drop of a hat. In uh, Telangana, there's a man called Nagaraju. He married a Muslim woman and the entire family came and lynched him. Where was the outrage? Suddenly, those who are doing Jai Bheem, Jai Meem, when the meme is the oppressor of the Bheem, they suddenly go silent. Or otherwise, they expect everyone to shout out for the meme, which they should, rightly so. There are, and I would hope someday Anand Rangnathan will also be here, and he will tell you there are at least 200 documented instances of Muslim mobs attacking people primarily, particularly from the uh, uh, Dalit community and others and lynching them to death. Isn't that outrageous? Of course it is. Now, if we were to only focus on only these cases of these 200 lynchings by allegedly by Muslim mobs of Dalits and other communities, what would the picture of India be? Just like that, we can't focus on that on the fact that only Akhlaq is being lynched or Pehlu Khan is being lynched. Lynchings are happening to give a law and order issue a color of one community trying to lynch the other. That is what I'm against. And I was against it then also. 
at that time also we said that don't make this about religion specific in a fact your peace a transgender is also wrong in fact your peace right. which spoke about how you want a new law actually ended with saying that the bjp should support this law because its own rss workers in kerala hmm. are at the receiving end sometimes of mob violence yeah. so you did make this point then yes what i'm saying to you today is that petition did you step back from that petition in the supreme court look i think that the inclinations of any of these campaigns must be where we treat every lynching as a law and order issue and not as an issue to politicize and communalize if that is the spirit i continue to be associated with it is that the spirit is the question tehsin claims that he takes up all these causes and he does not look at the religion that may be his stand but does the party he associates with or the bunch of politicians who make this an issue or the people from civil society who hold up placards on a very regular basis where are they where is that entire crowd of people today for instance what is happening in bengal in panchayati elections not a single panchayati election goes without violence where people are not lynched and killed where is rahul gandhi's tweet where is the tweet of any of these worthies who want to save democracy and ironically in bengaluru they will be meeting the same mamta banerji against whom adhiranjan choudhury is railing he is saying mamta is killing democracy in west bengal and in bengaluru you are going to save democracy with her as a young so person this is double standards and you are right to call them out but as a young person you how do you how have you over time made peace with the cynical real politic that we live with and you mentioned mamta and adhiranjan choudhury your example is on point some might turn around and you know i don't want to make this overtly about party politics because this is about you but just to understand how you look right. at politics some might turn around and say the prime minister called the nationalist congress party corrupt and now a section of it is with the bjp hmm. what i'm trying to say is the jaded citizen probably thinks ye to rajneeti mein hota hai sabke sath hota hai all parties for real politic come together unexpectedly when they need to will you give a specific example of this how the prime minister is not cut from the same cloth that the rest of them pratap sarnayak who was with the udhav camp uh, originally in the entire shiv sena when it was together he was one of the leaders who was accused of corruption it was called the tops case udhav ji's government the mv government was there in power they filed a c summary report against pratap sarnayak saying that he is not guilty of any corruption it was all a mistake this was in december 2021 our government in maharashtra came to power in june 2022 the cases against pratap sarnayak were all the, those who say that we have compromised on corruption in december 2022 and you can fact check this ed got up in high court and said the closure report given by the eow in mumbai police is wrong we are going to continue this case which case has stopped when we have let's say the allegation is that we've allied with allegedly corrupt people can you show me an instance where the cases have stopped they say about mukul roy right mukul roy was grilled by the cbi when he came when he was our vice so you're saying the cases will continue i'm saying why ally i'll tell you the reason because in the heat of political statements lot of statements are made back and forth somebody may call me corrupt i may call somebody corrupt the one thing we all rely upon is a court judgment a court judgment or a court process mm. is at least a a, a sub, is an objective parameter on the basis of which then you can decide that look at least here there is a court proceeding mr uddhav thakre by the way when he was with us had labeled Shara, sharad pawar as mahabhrasht how come he went and allied with sharad pawar i am saying everybody does it mai to nahi keh rahi no no no, no but i i am explaining the difference between bjp and these people mm. now on the basis of his statements should we he was our ally he was a senior partner for a very long period of time should we not consider his statements to be true when he says that the ncp is guilty of corruption he then goes and allies with sharad pawar the same sharad pawar who says in the name of secularism i will never ally with shiv sena they had in fact said shiv sena is responsible for the mumbai riots the shri krishna report bal sahib thakre was put in jail for for uh, in 2000 it was the congress ncp government the two of them ally that is fine No, it's not fine. It is the for, same. I would ask them for the same question. question. I would ask them the same question. No, but the point is that we have made statements which are all backed by court of law or proceedings of law. Lalu Prasad Yadav has been convicted four times by court of law. 
Yeah. He's been convicted four times. Is there any confusion whether he's corrupt? And those who are those who are facing charges will continue to face those charges. It is not the UPA government that we used to withdraw cases from Lalu when he wants to ally with us, then start the case against Mulayam Singh Yadav ji, then withdraw the disproportionate assets case. Contrary to that, in our uh, government, if even if there is an allegation of corruption, it will be investigated. It will go through the process of law. If you are guilty, then you'll have to face the music. If you're not, then you're fine. Let's talk about how Shahzad Punawala. Uh, By the way, may I just add one yes. point? You know, this entire narrative that ED, 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 there is no case on Dilip Balse Bhattar. Mm. He's a founding member of NCP. Why did he come with us? And if Ajit Pawar is so corrupt, as they claim, he's the mastermind of this corruption. Why was he the leader of opposition of the entire MBA? So, aap karo to chamat kari. Aur hum unko le le to bhrashta chari. He's not in our party. He's a separate party. He's there. He's aligned with the government. He's supporting the government. If there is any proof, first of all, you accept that the corruption took place under the Congress NCP government in 2014. Okay, okay. I want this, I want to bring the focus back to you because this is about knowing you inside out, right? We can always talk about politics on our on our uh, daily shows otherwise. I want to understand how you, Shehzad Punawala, right. a Modi critic, hmm. becomes a Modi supporter. Right. I've understood how you ended up leaving the Congress. Hmm. Now tell me that leap. How does that leap happen? After all, you could have left the Congress and joined a regional party. Right. You ended up with the BJP. Yeah. You were a Modi critic. You acknowledged that you were a Modi mm, critic. Of course. Right. How does that change happen? What makes it happen? And what happens to you internally for it to happen? First of all, before I come to answering that question, you have to give credit to somebody like Prime Minister Modi who takes his worst critics and gives them an opportunity purely on the fact of talent, merit, and commitment to a principle. So, now you tell me, if I was a strident, I'm a strident Gandhi critic, can I ever be taken in the Congress party? N-O. But here, somebody who has been a Modi critic, mm. gets the most prominent, one of the most prominent places in the BJP, shows that who is really tolerant, and who is really accepting, and who really has a democratic nature. This has been categorically established. Now, let me tell you, uh, I think evolution of our understanding of people and evolution of our understanding of issues is a constant in everybody's life. Let me give you an example. The Barkha, when she was 20 years old, does she have the same view of Barkha of today? No. Although Barkha is very young even today. <laughs> Not Maybe young, but I don't have Just the around view. somewhere in 30s. But no, thank you. <laughs> but, I, but, but does Barkha of 20s and Barkha of today no, have the same course, view on any change. issue? We all change. But... Your principles... We evolve. The core remains the same, but exactly. you evolve. What the was core my, doesn't change. Yeah, absolutely. What was my core? The core was not Modi ji and Rahul ji are personalities. These are, these are two individuals. The core was, whether in Congress or whether in BJP, that merit should be recognized. There should not be a situation of dynasty or parivarvat where you are given a position only because you have a surname. And thirdly, you must have a clear-cut position on what is appeasement and what is actually welfare and what is required for development. These three issues, these are principal issues. I had a similar view when I was in the Congress. In fact, I faced what I faced within the Congress because my views were contrary to what the first family expected of me. Therefore, I was sidelined. And therefore, the principle continues to be the same. Now, I have understood and evolved in my thinking on large number of issues. For instance, when I was back in school, I used to feel because we used to be taught that uh, communism is a very good way, equal distribution of resources. Everyone felt that was the best way. But by the time I got out of school and I started studying economics in, in my first year and second year of college, I realized that that is not a model that has survived in any country of the world. Even China, which calls itself communist, is actually capitalist. And therefore, you need a system where markets are allowed to uh, to have a kind of place in uh, in dominating uh, means of production. So that evolution takes place, just like our economic philosophy evolves. Our philosophies evolve on large number of things, but my principle remains the same, hmm. which is so, which is that there should be no compromise on this kind of attitude of merit. Merit should be given the topmost priority. A person should be recognized on merit and talent. That's only when a person who comes from a Chaiwala background can become the prime minister.
if it becomes about this feudal vestige that because you belong to a family you will get a position then in that case then you are not living in a republic you are living in a fiefdom or you are living in a kingdom you know sometimes i'm asked will you ever join politics would you ever consider politics and i always say no i couldn't do it one of the reasons i couldn't do there are many reasons that be terrible but one of the reasons that be terrible at it is that i have individual opinions that i would find very difficult to surrender for a group a larger group mm. has you ever felt uncomfortable and it doesn't matter it could be in the congress it could be in the bjp i i'm not making this a party specific question where you find yourself just in disagreement with the party that you're representing what do you do then it can't be that as a young man you agree with everything that your party stands for for example the government has taken a position on same sex marriage i don't know if as a person of your generation you agree with that position do you well you see these issues uh it is not based on my individual opinion mm. it has to be accepted by society mm. and social change takes more time my own views on the particular subject may be more progressive or maybe more uh, it may be slightly more different but when we are running a government and that government has to consider the views of 140 crore indians so at that point of time you have to give society time to evolve you can't superimpose your individual views on the society which won't be accepted so therefore if there is for instance i know that a large number of organizations associated with us have changed their positions on so many issues including the one that you're talking about the uh, the rss the the changed its position on decriminalizing yeah. homosexuality for so instance. so now the question is that should we push society into forcibly accepting our views just because we feel that those views should be the ones then i think that is also kind of liberal fund but how does change come change comes by creating the entire ambience for that change for instance uh, you can uh, have a situation where you will tell people that don't do corruption will that stop corruption no so what do you do you have a technological interference or intervention where the money is not going through the middleman it is going directly from the government to the beneficiary now if i was to start telling people don't do corruption the middleman if he gets an opportunity to do corruption he will do corruption but you create a technological intervention similarly you need to create socio political and economic interventions that create the right atmosphere in society that the changes can be accepted see when sati was abolished it was done by imposing a law but that time we were not a free democratic country it was done forcibly by the british mm. but today when we live in a society which is democratic and nobody is democratic are you saying that somebody can't have a democratic view against uh, gay marriage should they not be allowed to have a view against gay marriage no i mean anyone can have any view right? as long as so it is not hate speech as long it's not a, it's that's not right. smear the community absolutely so if they why how should their democratic view also be taken on board and how should the rights of the community affected also be taken on board and we come to a consensus where a road can be built where both sides can agree that's you, the, but essentially but you, but, the art of democracy but you sometimes no let me give you one more example yeah in america now the right to abort has been taken away by the supreme court yes so i am saying that these things are happening in all democracies and the way forward would be to build a mass of of social political thought that supports the change rather than impose the change and then have a reaction on it do you feel uncomfortable disappointed i don't know choose the word you want mm -hmm. to that at the moment the bjp does not have a muslim member of parliament in the lok sabha hmm. in the lok sabha hmm. before you give me the rajya sabha example hmm. that you do um do you feel at the same time there is a very interesting outreach going on between the bjp and the pasmanda muslim community which you have actually explained you yourself hmm. if going by your original uh, last family name would belong to how do you look at the bjp and its outreach or lack of with the in with the muslim community there might be millions of uh, homosexual people in this country yes does congress party have any declared homosexual mp no does it not represent the rights of homosexuals is it against homosexuals not that i i mean i am not a spokesperson right. for the congress so i'm not asking you as a spokesperson yeah, yeah. but you wouldn't think right i don't think so 
Similarly, is it necessary that only if my Lok Sabha MP happens to be a Muslim, he will consider or work for the Muslim community? No, in fact, it's like if someone says only women should be women and child development exactly. minister, I don't agree with it. That's right. So that so, point is taken. But, 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 but I tell you. But it's not, you're making a clever argument, but not, 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 not a genuine one. Because you know what I'm okay. asking. You know what I'm asking. Let's have a, let genuine, me, let let's me, have a genuine conversation. I'm having a genuine yeah. conversation. Two aspects to this. One. From the first Lok Sabha from 1952 to the Lok Sabha of 2004, and I'm talking about pre-Modi era, because after Modi ji, people think that this country has, democracy is over in this country. So I'm saying pre-Modi ji era, when democracy was very full. In that time, the population of Muslims was around 12, 13%, 14%. The representation of Muslims average in these Lok Sabhas is 5.3%. Okay. Who's responsible? BJP? BJP was the born in 1980, came into prominence after 98 for the first time and now into majority government after 2014. Who denied the Muslims their representation? I'm not saying what about me that Congress didn't do it. I'm saying why didn't it happen during the Congress years? Congress is the bastion of secularism. Chalo, Congress ke baad, there were other parties who claimed secularism. The reason is that, uh, let me give you one more example. In Gujarat, the only time Gujarat Gujarat has about 10% Muslim population. So if you see in terms of seats, 180 seats in the assembly, you should give 18 to Muslims. The only time Congress party in Gujarat has given above 10 seats to Muslims is in 1995. Modi ji was not on the scene in Gujarat. Yeah. He came after 2000. Yeah. What prevented Congress to give 18 seats in every election in Gujarat? Winnability. Winnability. I am a very talented spokesperson of the BJP. If I get a ticket from the BJP, will I win an election? I don't know. Not as of now. You might. I don't know. Would, Maybe, you, want, would, you, want, only, would you want to contest? I was going to, that was going I to be one to of the, my questions. I'm just giving this example for okay. another reason. Okay. The reason is that winnability is the ultimate touchstone in a political contest of a democracy. Right? We don't, we give people to, uh, we give tickets to people who will win the election. That is the political contest in a democracy. It's a legitimate political contest. You don't give tickets to people who are going to lose an election. Not as the Congress, not as the Samajwadi party, not as any other party. So in that circumstances, just on the aspect of winnability, obviously you're going to give your most winnable candidate. It is, it is actually the most secular choice that is being but made. But you know, this is the basis on which women have been... Let's pick up, pick up another subgroup women, mm -hmm. right? For as long as I've been in journalism, I have seen the story of women's reservation bill. Literally for as long as I've been in journalism. And for decades now, we've heard the same argument about winnability. It's the same argument that's given. I'm just saying there has to be a better way. No, I think around that, this. I think that uh, the entire parameter to judge inclusiveness in society and in the uh, in the share of development should not be restricted to whether there is a Muslim Lok Sabha MP or whether there is a minister who happens to be from the Muslim community. The touchstone should be as follows, in my opinion. Mr. Modi runs some of the most biggest social welfare schemes. I call him the Messiah of social welfare. Mm. When he sends a tap water connection to, and he sent 11 and a half crores of them to households who didn't have it, does Sultana and Shilpa both get it? Yes. When he sends a toilet to 12 crore people and we become open defecation free, barring a few instances here and there, nothing is, there might be one or two instances you can pick up. But when we go from that stage where women had to lock themselves up and could not go and relieve themselves for hours and today they are in a position to go and do that and then spend their time on education. Does that not treat Sultana, Shilpa, Mary, Matthew, Mohit, Madhav, Mohammed? 80 crore people got rations. One instance where a Muslim family came to anybody and said, Ki hame ration nahi mila mera naam Abdullah hai. Is there an instance of where the three and a half crore awas that has been given, the house, pakka house that has been given, most of which, by the way, are in the name of women. Their ownership has been given so that the women gets a stake in that property. Three and a half crore houses built. Please show me one instance of so discrimination. I, I, I take this so point. taking that point forward. The problem with this narrative is that it is not even about the Muslim representation. It's not a it's narrative, not about, it's a question. It is not. Do we not why. want a inclusive parliament? And this is not only about Muslims. I gave you the example of women, right? I, I would like to see more women in parliament. But I have another question for you, Barka, because we're having a conversation yes, on an interview of yeah. that sort. 
Why should only the Muslims be the representatives of minorities in this country? One second. We are the second biggest majority. Are you telling me that Muslims with 15, 14, 15 percent population, uh, 20 crore Muslims are considering themselves as minority? Why, why isn't this question how many Parsi MPs are there? Minority my minority, Jain MPs, Buddhist MPs. Why not the question that uh, uh, how many are there from uh, other com communities in the minority Sikh community? Hardi Puri is a Sikh. He's a cabinet minister with multiple portfolios. Why isn't that said ever? Why was the minority commission chairperson always a Muslim? Now it is Mr. Lal Pura, a Sikh. Jain members were not there in the committee, in the commission. Why? And why is it that these communities, which are micro, micro, micro uh, minorities, like the Parsis or the Jains, one second, then not one Parsi have I met in my life who said that we haven't progressed because we don't have a Parsi minister. In fact, they are foremost, if you see in per capita income, in education and in all standards. How? Because it is not a function about who's your MP. That system, I'm glad that separate electorates that I need a Muslim MP to yeah, represent yeah, me is over. Who, that was Jinnah's thought. This is not Gandhi. Uh, Gandhiji's thought at all. I, I agree with that. I just leave it wide open for you to think about representation in general. It's not only about... I, I always say women. I want to see more women in parliament. Tell me how that will happen. Yeah. But but let's, let's, let me pick up another thread here. The women thing. Yeah. How many women are editor chief, editor in chief of channels? Women leadership. Forget political, political system. No, no, I agree. Forget political system and winability on the basis of large number of I, aspects. I agree. You are right. Just on talent. Where are the women CEOs? You are right. Where are the women You are owners? right. You are Where right. Are, unless they are daughters of somebody. You are right. You, you are right. So that's what I'm saying. Why is it that a societal issue is then being subtly converted into a political issue and the BJP is being beaten with a stick with it. I am only asking you, would you like to see, just like I would like to see more women, I would like to see, actually you're right, the examples you've named of Sikhs, of Parsis, I think we have to just think more about how we can, about inclusivity. I don't know the best way to get there, but I think... Even in our own newsrooms, in our own organizations, we're not as inclusive as we should be, right? Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, I think that rather than force uh, inclusivity from the top, yeah, like we always think that a law will come or we give some something and then it will become more inclusive. The inclusivity needs to be generated from the bottom, wherein if everybody has a certain amount of socio-economic position and all of them are at a certain level of economic development, then obviously that will allow them more access to opportunity. You don't need to give the person the fish. You need to teach him how to fish. And if he learns that, then the access to opportunity is what you need to create. You don't need to hold somebody's hand and get them into parliament. You need to tell them that here are a set of conditions we're creating so that you have the access to fight an election would, and be into parliament. Would you want to contest next? I What next for Shahzad Punawala? For me, it is, I am already at the place I want to be, which is to communicate a leader's position and a leader's commitment to the country and his work to the people. I think a lot of young people would want two questions for you to answer. Right. One, who does your research? Because right. as I said, you are incredibly well researched. Right. So how do you prepare for a television or a broadcast debate? I have a, a, a standard or a parameter that I apply and it, I applied it even in my days when I was doing television as an anchor is that if I have to speak for five minutes, I will read for 50 minutes. I will read for 50 minutes on a subject, various points of view, yeah. data, facts, etc. Yeah. And only then I will speak for five minutes. So if I go for a set of television debates, I make it a ritual to read and, 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 and learn everything about the subject before I go for the debate for at least two hours. At least two hours. And where do you find these two hours in the day? I'm constantly, uh, right now my phone is inside, but my phone is always, on, one phone is always on the news and the other phone is always on uh, the the topic that I'm interested in or I feel yeah. is going to make news yeah. for the day. But you I'm do your own research. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't take any, because you see, you can't be, We've seen uh, people being instructed even on PC platforms and they're being told what their party position is in the years being whispered. Mm. I'm obviously referring to Jairam Ramesh being a personal prompter for Rahul. But I don't think that works. You need to know the subject in depth. You need to study it. You need to be passionate about it. You need to be hungry to know more about it on your own. So you right now you're happy, but would you want to contest an election? Uh, 
I would not want to ideally contest any elections because I don't think that I am right now in that space or temperament to, I'm not a public servant in that sense because a public servant, those who are serving in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, they are people of exceptional maturity, exceptional caliber, exceptional commitment to the people. Right now, I may have a gift of the gap. I may speak well, I may communicate well, but am, am I as committed to the cause of public service as our elected leaders perhaps if i if i evolve myself to that level of maturity and commitment then why not but right now i'm not there and i would be uh, very uh, unfair to those 700 or 800 or talented people if i start uh, throwing my hat in a race where they are more equipped let me ask you this in the end uh, you know uh, in politics like in any other part of life, I think you should be able to disagree and still be friends. Right. Right. Uh, do you have friends across the political spectrum? Oh, of course. <laughs> None of my friends are uh, uh, most, I mean, some of them are, of course, from the BJP, but uh, many of my friends are uh, very stridently against BJP. They're stridently against BJP, but we know that uh, their differences stem from a position of their understanding of an issue. And that doesn't affect my friendship with them. Uh, and they also know that what I do is because I believe in a set of principles. And they have seen my transition over the period of years and they know me as a person. So they don't, uh, they don't judge me because I am in the BJP. In fact, they are open to hearing about the BJP and various aspects of the BJP which they didn't know about. So I, in fact, keep them closer because they are my sounding board as to how much of an impact I'm actually making uh, when I'm communicating to them. It's ultimately about converting those people who don't necessarily look at the BJP. Have you, have, have you kept any sort of personal relationship alive with the Congress leaders you worked with? You had a particularly vitriolic parting with Manish Tiwari. Yes. There were audio tapes that came That's out it. of conversations yeah. that, that he was purportedly part of. Uh, many of them. Many of them in the Congress. And uh, in fact, uh, I congratulate them or I wish them on their birthday, they wish me on mine or we, uh, if they have written a book, I compliment them or if there is a program they invite me for, I'm always there. Look, in politics, we are not mortal sworn enemies of each other. Yeah. In the, This country has to be run by all of us putting our heads together. This country is bigger than any political party. It is bigger than any political, uh, you know, thought process. And therefore, it is necessary that all of us come together. We can't be divided into Congress states and BJP states, into Congress and BJP ideologies. When we run the country, Prime Minister Modi doesn't think that, oh, because he's a Congress supporter, my scheme won't reach him. Prime Minister doesn't think that, oh, because, uh, you know, this person, uh, this MP, he has spoken against me, so he will not get the MP-lad fund. That's not how countries work. That's not how governance works. And therefore, it is a spirit of, of being able to accept people and this is there in our scriptures in our scriptures we have even accepted and prayed to those who have disagreed with the uh, the sacred text the entire philosophy of charva is about even uh, celebrating those who oppose your most sacred text so this philosophy and i'll tell you in the bjp it is it is such an open democratic spirit I am just a national spokesperson of the party, but I can tell my national president, I can tell my national leaders anything I want on any policy or other issue, if obviously I have the credibility on that, and they will be happy to listen to me and tell me that where I may be right or I may be wrong. That spirit of conversation then translates into having the same with other political leaders. If there is one thing hmm. that you would want to change about politics, one hmm. thing, what would it be? The one thing I would want to change about politics is that people with this kind of only thing that they have to add is that their family name. And because they come from a particular family which may have done something 50 years ago, because of that, people think that they are entitled to a position in politics. I think that needs to end completely in our, in our system. Uh, it's there not just in politics, it's there in Bollywood, it's there in many other places. So it's not exclusively to politics, but I am a firm believer on uh, people making their own mark and their own uh, contribution rather than latching on to somebody's surname and then going forward. And therefore, if you see, I have taken a conscious decision that I will probably never have my own child. If at all, I will have an adopted child. Uh, I, but I don't want that child to if at all I have reached somewhere in life to take my name and then go forward. Whatever the child does, the child will have to do on 
its own she will have to do or he will have to do it on its own so that spirit should be there if the child is good wo apna kar lega if the child is bad sab kuch karne ke baad bhi koi fayda nahi so therefore this thing that because i am son of so and so i should get something this i hate it and this was the reason i could not i would feel suffocated in congress and this is why i feel like i'm blossoming in bjp because in bjp even somebody who puts a poster a booth and nadda ji has shared this with me nadda ji he uh, was essentially spent a lot of his growing up age in bihar he swimmer on state level swimmer very uh, active in state politics in uh, student politics and his journey from putting posters everywhere to the national president of the bjp it is only possible in the bjp it is only possible in the bjp and this government that a person who stood outside gate of white house looking at the white house building today was received by joe biden and jill biden at the terrace of white house and it is the congress twice only in the bjp no evidence well shahzad i was going to say when you were talking that you are an example of somebody who's made it completely on your own without any family patronage so of course it is possible and yes. and may there be more people i i would agree with you uh, on that in principle may there be more people who are able to make it on their own terms without the bjp is the only party that offers this opportunity please and i'm just taking 10 seconds i know you want to wind up but please just look at one thing objectively the rjd its president can only be from one family the samajwadi party only from one family uh, the tmc i think only from one family no other family uddhav sena only from one family and the congress now may have put mr khadge forward but we know who controls all the affairs it's only one family it is only the bjp that no matter which family you belong to the communists not, sorry i'm just thinking the communists Uh, well you know i was very upset when uh, mr karat and his wife both were in the in the political room so where have they stood on their principles and therefore it is only the bjp for all people of my generation and the generation after me i think gen z the only place where uh, you can actually have your talent you know result in something concrete is the bj bharti janta party and it is evident look at our look at our list of presidents neither is somebody's son nor is somebody son or daughter guaranteed a place in the presidency of the party just because they happen to be somebody son or daughter this is only possible in the bjp the bjp is that platform of aspirational india that no other party can actually be well we wish you the very best i uh, look forward to having you on our program again and look forward to the incredible memes that i know will also be uh, cut by our loyal fans from this conversation uh, i think we must all be able to take a joke or two about ourselves thank you very much as that all the best thank you.